In Trinidad and Tobago, good of you to be with us as we move into the second hour of Morning Edition as far as our interviews. Well, it was in early July that Finance Minister Colin Imbert announced a tax amnesty for all taxes uh, for, for the period uh, towards the end of, uh, to, of the year 2020, December, 21st, December 31st, 2020, and the end of May for additional taxes in 2021. Once those returns are filed from July the 5th, to September the 17th, and we are getting close uh, to that deadline. According to the Finance Minister, the amnesty, as I said before, is applicable for the years up to December 31st, 2020, and for the period January 1st, 2021, to May 31st, 2021 and uh, the deadline obviously is quickly approaching today is already the 10th of september so it's a week away let's hear from a couple members of the business community on the impact if it's a positive impact of the tax amnesty we're joined by the president of the ttcsi the coalition of services industries mark edgel and uh, the head of the tobago business chamber martin george good morning gentlemen thanks very much uh, for joining us mark edgel if, if we could start with you uh, your perspective on this on this tax amnesty which is due to run out in a week's time. Hi, good morning, Fazir. Morning, everyone. Um, the tax amnesty, of course, is a welcome um, scenario provided by the Minister of Finance, um, but it is a mechanism to encourage people who have not paid their tax and who have evaded tax, uh, to, you know, so, so to speak, uh, to get them to come in and, and, and pay their taxes without any penalties or interest. Now, with respect to um, the tax amnesties, I think a lot of people right now, uh, because of how their businesses are suffering, um, they are looking for tax holidays as opposed to tax amnesties. Um, this is this is you know to assist in in recovering and getting back to business, you know, and working through this pandemic situation where the government is not providing uh, enough stimulus or support for the business community and for small businesses so in, in, in particular. Um, we, we, we're looking for better, you know, better consideration in that regard and also putting a, a, a limit to the tax amnesty during this difficult time for people that are going through many different phases of, of, of problems, uh, whether it be business, personal, financial. Uh, it, it, it does pose an additional pressure during a stressful time uh, for people to comply with a deadline. And we're also seeing it now with, uh, with a November deadline on the property tax applications as well. And before I bring uh, Mr. George into the discussion, how would you respond, Mr. Edgel, to the assertion, well, look, the, the government needs money as well. The government needs money to, to, to provide a, a, maybe a wider safety net for the most vulnerable in our society. So as much as it may be difficult, you had to pay the tax. Absolutely. And I 100% agree with that. The government is in a difficult position. The taxation and the collection of taxes that are outstanding, they are well within their right to collect it. I'm not objecting to that. Um, the timing is just a little difficult where people uh, to meet a deadline may be difficult. I mean, one of the one of the issues I can see is people that need the assistance of accountants, for example, everyone has been working with limited staff and, and, and the cycling of, of staff on, on days on, days off. So the capacity to handle the, the, the necessary services for people who need uh, financial assistance or, or the financial accounting assistance to prepare their tax routines and have them submitted and pay their tax is also a challenge. So that does need to take, be taken into account. But absolutely, the taxes do need to be paid if they are due. Um, and we do understand that the government is in a position where the tax collection does need to offset the losses in or, or, or the reduction in the foreign exchange in, uh, uh, in flows from the energy sector. Martin George, thanks, thanks very much for joining us as well. Let, let's get your, your opening perspective in, in relation uh, to, to the situation of the tax amnesty and, and the broader issues around it. Your, your perspective, good morning to you. Yeah, hi, good morning to you, Fazir. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Fazir, you know, the thing is, one has to consider it as a balancing act. And yes, we understand that the government has a need to collect taxes. That's part of the social contract we all entered into by, you know, being part of civil society. However, there is the fact that, for instance, take, for instance, the contractors who have recently lamented the fact that the government has over half a billion dollars outstanding for some of them 
You have some of them with millions and millions of dollars in unpaid bills from the government. So therefore, in a circumstance like that, it's really, really hard to say, well, look, you are sticking to this deadline of 17 September for your amnesty. I think definitely it needs to be extended to 31st December to at least give people a little breathing room because you're hoping that, look, maybe if the um, curfew and the state of emergency ends in November and there's going to be a little easing of the economic activity so that people could get a little, you know, windfall over the Christmas period, then at least people might be in a better position. You think also, as you, of so many other service providers and suppliers to the government who have bills outstanding. I'm not just talking to contractors. I'm talking about every man of service. You have people who are being owed by the government. And while these people have had the whole strain, it's kind of hard to then turn around on them and say, well, look, hey, your time is up with this amnesty. I'm coming after you for your taxes. You know, So I think that really and truly, in the balancing act that the government has to do because they have to understand how people feel out there. It's not just a question of, well, okay, I need to come down with a heavy hand and collect the taxes. And, you know, as Mark mentioned, the, the property tax also, I think even that with the November 30th deadline, I think that's highly unrealistic with the greatest of respect. And that has to, I think, be pushed somewhere into 2021 because there's no way that in the midst of all that is going on, you can tell people that, look, um, you have to meet this deadline. You have to get all these things in order, get your deed, get copies of this get this when even the government offices which are supposed to supply these deeds and um, certificates and everything they most times are not functioning you go to apply for anything you you look right now we've sent a power of attorney to be registered they've given us a, a timeline of two months to collect it two months to collect it just a registered copy of the document so it's quite impractical and implausible in the light of the current pandemic, the current circumstances of many of these government offices not functioning properly. And the thing is, you now have the online system that has been implemented by the Registrar General's office. Most persons are not registered on that online system. In fact, most attorneys are not yet even registered on that online system. And that is what they're now saying is the system whereby you have to access if you want to apply for copies of deeds or documents or all those things. So therefore, it is not a scenario where you have now implemented this. People have to learn the system. You, you're talking about people who may not have access to a device, who may not have access to you know an online platform, and then they have to do all the registration. Then they have to apply online for all these things. So I think when one looks at it, holistically while we understand the intent and the need it clearly is not a practical or pragmatic measure at this time and i think there need to be extensions of both deadlines the 17 september deadline for the tax amnesty i think that should be pushed to the first december and i think definitely the november 30th deadline for the property tax registration has to go somewhere into 2022 and the finance minister did indicate when he spoke in early July that there is the possibility, and if, if I could quote him correctly, he says that as we have done in the past, we will, be, we will be able to prescribe a later date by order to extend that period if it becomes necessary. So from, from what you're saying there, it is necessary to extend it that will deadline. It's necessary for you because I could tell you that online registration system for the uh, Register General's office, as I tell you, most attorneys are not yet registered on that. So much less for members of the general public. So how are you going to access if you have to provide copies of your deed, if you don't have it, if you have to provide copies of other official government documents that you need from the Registrar General's office? It's not practical at all. And I think maybe that's something they did not factor in because that's something from the Attorney General's office where the Registrar General falls under. And with that new system being implemented, that I think the public will need some time to get up to speed with that system. And getting back to, to Mark Edgel, as and, and, and clearly we, we started our discussion. In fact, where you were invited to be part of the discussion to talk about this uh, this this tax amnesty thing. But obviously, it brings into to, to the conversation 
broader issues related to the bureaucracy and administration of, of things. You, you highlighted, uh, Mr. Edgel, issues related to getting uh, your, your, your things in order via an accountant. But just for the sake of argument, obviously, we, we're talking about arrears. So shouldn't those things have been sorted out already with your accountants or with business people with their accountants? Because we're talking about arrears here, aren't we? Absolutely. As I said, I mean, I do encourage and support anyone who has tax outstanding to make those payments. But we're also looking at people, uh, small business owners who are not exactly tax compliant, um, even with their registration requirements and so on. So what we found is even with uh, potential grant scenarios in Trinidad for the pandemic um, assistance, people have not been able to access, when I say people, small businesses have not been able to access those grants because they are not up to date with all their statutory requirements, registration and NIS, you know, PAY health surcharge, all those things are not in order or not in good order. And this is one of the things that we are actually working at the TTCSI to, to facilitate um, better training and education for people to understand how to go about these things if they, if they currently do not. Um, I mean, something we need to, we need to understand or, or what we're realizing is that during the pandemic, it has been business as usual almost um, the, the, the pandemic management has almost been like a parallel healthcare system for, for, for the, the, the COVID patients where the government has the Ministry of Health and, and so on handling or, or managing that aspect of it. But with regard to everything else going on in the government, it seems to be very much business as usual. And without sufficient consultation with the private sector and the business community, to determine what impacts may occur by how they put things out into the public to achieve what they are trying to inclusive of the tax collection, um, tax amnesties and so on. The, the receptiveness of these things become problematic. So, I mean, one of the things I would recommend is that when the government, the steps that they're looking to take, at least consult with the business community on how it may impact before they actually put it out and then have to deal with the repercussions and, and, and the negative feedback. And, and, and Mr. Edgell, I think one of the concerns for, 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 for people generally is that you often wonder if there, there, there are parallel universes here because you get government dictates about this, that and the other that these need to be sorted out. And as Mr. George mentioned, it sounds easy to say on paper or to issue a statement that you need to get X, Y, Z by next week. And then when you go to the office, they say, well, you'll get an appointment for two months from now, which is not practical at all. So, I mean, you are the helm now of the TTCSI. I mean, is there any dialogue in that in that regard? As at least bring it to the attention of the nearest minister you could find that, like, all oh, you're living in a, in, a, in a separate world to the rest of us. Fazir, this comes back to my my clamoring and pleading for better collaboration and consultation between the private sector or the business or the business organizations, community representatives of of, of, of the government, um, the, the the private sector institutions. Uh, to have that collaboration and discussions. And also, as I've said before, I believe to you on the show, we need to see more participation by the professionals in the specific sectors on the state boards, making and contributing to the establishment of the policy. Because as you rightly said, it's a parallel universe. We have, we have policies being made that do not fully support or line up with what the requirements are of specific sectors and for the benefit of the sector to grow or even develop in an export environment, which is what the TTCSI is also pushing towards. So if we had better representation from the sectors on these boards, you will have a, a, a more applicable approach, a more feasible approach, a more um, a, a better way of, 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 of coming up with solutions to implement policies that will actually work and develop and support the different sectors. Well, when we when last you spoke to us, uh, you, you talked up, you brought up the issue again of the real estate sector, and within two days you got the green light. So, so who knows? You might you might get another green light soon. But but, but be, before we time runs out, let me just get Martin George's perspective again on this situation because I, 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 again, I mean, I, I was in Tobago last week with with, 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 with the madam, and Tobago deader than dead. I, 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 I have to say, Mr. George, but, but and, and in that sort of environment, that, that, that reality, I mean, does the THA get it? Does the government get it as to what is really going on out there? 
Fizzy, you, you, you know, you really feel sometimes as if you're in a twilight zone, as if, you know, you, you hear the dictates coming from on high and you wonder, do these people ever walk the streets of the common man and mingle with the population to understand what is going on out there? Look, I mean, just to digress, Fizzy, the issue of the number of flights to Tobago, you know, I mean, for the retreat which the government held in Tobago, can you imagine what would have been the situation at the airport with only three flights running and you have all these government ministers plus all the entourages plus all the security plus everything they having to go up on a weekend where would the ordinary person have had a chance to get a single seat on a flight to go to tobago and that's the kind of thing i talk about i mean i i saw Subsequently, okay, thankfully the Prime Minister did increase the number of flights, but when I saw the increase, it was just by one. You know, so I mean, still you have that disconnect. You have a disconnect also for zero, in that the government is coming on the public and saying, Look, you need to pay up, you need to do these things. Look at the disconnection drive that was started in the height of the pandemic. I mean, I was one of the first persons to speak out against it. I said, You cannot be serious, you know. People are finding it difficult to get basic necessities and you are there coming down with this heavy hand about, you know, you, you, you are disconnecting people for, you know, a few dollars when you as an institution, Wasser, you have been wasting billions of dollars, billions of dollars over the years. You could not be serious. The same thing, look at the NI, the National Insurance Board. You know, they are in such a disarray for you. You know, there are situations where persons pay their monies pay their NIS contributions, and they do not get receipts. They do not get receipts. I mean, th th this situation is such a mess that while we uh, urge and encourage persons, yes, pay your pay your taxes, pay your NIS contributions, etc., the government also has to recognize where it is falling short. Look at the question of VAT returns due to so many business persons outstanding for years. You know, but you're telling them, look, if you don't pay your VAT, you're going to be penalized. But then when I process everything and I'm supposed to get my return, you're saying, well, no, um, I can't pay you yet. Come on. The, 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 the playing field has to be leveled and there has to be a level of empathy. That's all we're asking for. You know, maybe what our government ministers and leaders need to do, come and sit Talk with the common man. Come and sit and talk with persons like Fazir Mohammed on this morning show, and they will get a better insight into what the reality of life is like for the ordinary person out there. It is not easy and it is not simple. And as you said, Fazir, for Tobago, I mean, Tobago is in a crisis economically. And I mean, the thing is, with no beaches open, you're talking about little or no domestic tourism activity because there's very little incentive for Trinidadians to go to Tobago now. You know, no bars are open, no restaurants, etc. So, you know, you have to look at these things and understand that, yes, while we want to collect more taxes and collect more payments and encourage persons to pay their NIS, etc., we also have to balance it and recognize that, look, persons are in a difficult place and that we ourselves as government, we are not in a perfect state at all. There are things that they need to fix. Martin George and, uh, of course, our uh, other guest uh, with us this morning, Mark Edgel. Thank you very much uh, this morning for taking the time. And uh, to, to, again, reiterate the realities out there for the business community and the wider population of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. 7.24 in Trinidad and Tobago as uh, we move uh, right along. And, and, and yes, it, it is, it is, you, often, you often wonder, where do these people live? I mean, we know where they're going to be this afternoon when they formally open the parliament and so on, when the first 12th session or 13th session or 59th session, whatever session it is. But where do these people live uh, when, when we talk about the realities? Well, as uh, we go to the break, here are some pink roses, courtesy of a Pity Valley viewer who says that the reason they're so vibrant is because of coffee grounds. You know, the dregs at the, at the, at the, at the bottom of the cup? Save it and use it in, in, in some of your plants and the flowers and so on and you could end up with, with, with lovely roses like this, you never know. And now a sunset captured in the area of the Maracas Lookout, a very familiar scene uh, but still a very beautiful scene sent to us again by the Joseph family. Very nice image indeed as we, we look uh, at that beautiful image of uh, the sunlight reflecting on uh, the water. We'll be right back.